Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this event. I'm really excited to moderate today's panel discussion on cross-border government innovation. In a world in continuous change, where complex issues have become the norm and governments are increasingly looking beyond their borders to develop solutions to global challenges. But there are many examples where this is already happening from ending pandemics to tackling migration to reduce economic carbon dependency. It's not yet clear how cross-border collaboration can be best achieved. Now, the question is, how can government really get better at innovating together for the public good? And this is one of the key questions we are raising to experts in our series of cross-border webinars. And we have a stellar set of speakers to answer it today. But before, before we get to a start, let me introduce Janusz Bertuk, Deputy Director of the OECD Public Governance Directorate, who will deliver some opening remarks. Janusz, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much, Marco, and thank you all speakers for uh, this session on cross-border government innovation, and uh, thank you everyone for joining this dialogue. The COVID-19 crisis has changed our life. It accelerated the digital transformation and the pace and scale of innovation, and uh, at the same time, it's also exposed several shortcomings of pre-existing vulnerabilities. At the national level, it highlighted the lack of preparedness among governments to tackle global challenges. And Marco, you already highlighted some of them, uh, but I would like to start, uh, and of course the climate uh, change, this is uh, high on the national and the international agenda, but also the pandemic or the, glo the, the global, this is the value chain and the disruptions in the global value chain. So for that reason, uh, at the global level, I think we need to face so many critical issues because during the pandemic, we witnessed how public sector innovation has become a key tool to collectively address today's most pressing challenges. And at the same time, we face that government innovation efforts today, they are largely confined to national and local borders. So why is collaboration at the, this really across at the global level is not happening more often. How we can make this break in order to change the paradigm. The OECD Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, the OPSI, and the UAE Mohammed bin Rashid Center for Government Innovation, we have been working together in partnership over the last year in order to determine what innovative practices governments can best support cross-border collaboration. Together, we have conducted extensive research, had a global call for innovation to collect good insights and practices, and also facilitated a number of open global workshops on cross-border innovation. Last month, we launched the first results of this series of three reports this was on achieving cross-border government innovation. And this report highlighted that issues facing governments are increasingly complex and transboundary in nature. They require existing governance mechanisms for international cooperation to adjust and adapt for managing them. It also showed how governments are leveraging new governance structures, including innovative governance bodies, horizontal networks, coordinated systems approaches in order to tackle issues that cut across borders. Why these efforts have provided an architecture for cross-border government innovation, a number of governments have employed other novel methods to bring forth new thinking and test potential innovative solutions. Today, I'm really pleased to be here with our partners from the UAE to launch the second, and this report on surfacing insights and experimenting across borders. The OPSI team, and led by Marco, they will add the URL for this report in the Zoom chat. Just a few words, how we see that experimentation emerge as a key mode on innovation in government. It is gradually becoming a norm. Ideas 
you know, they are becoming more realistic solutions from this efforts in order to test and help implementation to promote learning and how to keep, for example, the risks levels manageable. The success of experimentation within countries has led governments to apply similar approaches in cross-border and even global context. The report, the second report, includes a number of case studies, best practices, tools, and resources, and recommendations to governments to help governments make progress in surfacing and testing new ideas across borders. Let me give two examples. The Deep Space Food Challenge is an international collaboration between the Canadian Space Agency and the US, the NASA, that incentivizes innovation to address gaps in the field of food production technologies. But this could also meet the needs of space exploration in addition to address terrestrial needs such as reducing food insecurity on Earth. Another example is the Global Innovation Collaborative, is a network and a platform for collaboration through which city governments from around the world, they launch open innovation competitions and invite passionate innovators to deploy solutions in local test beds. This resulted more resilient and sustainable cities. For speakers, and I thank you again for joining today because you are engaged with these two case studies and other initiatives discussed in the report. I really hope that you will find this dialogue and the findings and the conclusions of this report useful. That can lead to a larger debate on how governments can come and direct innovation for global collective action. Before I conclude, I'd like to pick up a brief poll to get your views from the audience and start this dialogue. So the question, is it possible to put on the screen the question? So the question is, thank you so much. You could see that it asks, what is the most, what you consider the most important challenge or barrier to cross-border government innovation? You could see the four options for your consideration to choose from the cultural aspect, the barriers and norms, or more the lack of feedback mechanisms and learning loops. The ecosystem, which is undeveloped as a background, or the scaling of experiments. So thank you so much for your feedback and insights. And uh, the results of this poll will be discussed very shortly during the, the dialogue. I wish you all fruitful discussion. And this is really a great pleasure to pass the floor to a partner and Abir Talak, the director of the UAE Mohammed bin Rashid Center for Government Innovation. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. And it's always a pleasure to be with this group. Um, happy to meet everyone and allow me to share my screen. Yes, so um, hello, my name is Abir Tahlek. I'm the director of the Mohammed Rashid Center for Government Innovation in the UAE's Prime Minister's Office. Um, I'd like to begin by letting you know that in the UAE, we set very um, high ambitious um, and our goal is by 2071, or the aim is to be the world's leading nation. So I thought I'll use my allocated five minutes to present to you all um, the UAE and our public sector innovation um, and, you know, and, and, the, and our most recent cross-border um, uh, collaboration. So for 2071, we've set four government priorities. Um, to be the world's leading economy, the world's leading education, the world's happiest society, and the world's leading government. And in a few days, on December 2nd, the UAE will be celebrating its golden jubilee, uh, will be turning 50. So in preparation for the special day and the UAE government 
um, earlier this year, uh, the UAE hosted its ministerial retreat to plan for the next 50. So the discussions revolved around leapfrogging the UAE in all sectors and also increasing the rate um, of collaboration across entities and agencies across the nation. So this marks um, a new phase for the UAE. And we are aware that we need to start shifting our gears to achieve the mission we've set for 2071. And the question um, you have just um, um, nudged in this call is actually um, one of the main questions that we as the UAE even acknowledge and understand is you know, how to move forward. So recently, a list of, of principles have been announced to provide this direction for our next 50 years to guide um, for the country's next era, if we may call it, and a new government methodology and framework were also announced um, to deliver those 10 leadership principles for our next 50 years. And uh, the methodology underlines five main takeaways. So government will be led by major transformative projects. Uh, the government cycle will be flexible and fast, and of course, you know, Agile is, is the main concept. Sectoral priorities will be defined and ministerial teams will be created to deliver on them. Performance contracts will, defined, uh, will, be, will define the shared ownership and expected results. And of course, performance will be measured leading to incentives and rewards. So, and this is where we come into play, if you may say. So the Mohammed Rashid Center for Government Innovation, we were established to cultivate a culture of innovation within government sector through the development, of course, of an inte integrated framework. Um, we at the center, we aim to make innovation one of the key pillars of the UAE government in line with the vision of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, uh, UAE Vice President, Prime Minister and Ruler of Dubai to enhance governmental operations and the, and the country's competitiveness by making the government one of the most innovative um, governments in the world and promoting um, you know, the digital knowledge-based economy. And hence the Mohammed Rashid Center, of course, was established to be in the center um, of government and to be a champion entity for this effort in um, the government. And of course, our model, um, we always operate around enabling capabilities, enriching the culture, and of course, pushing for experimentation in, the, in, in government work. And as I just mentioned, we're here to, to strengthen the whole ecosystem regionally and internationally um, across, across board. And as, as leadership in the UAE and we at the center, we truly believe that human capital is the most important resource that, that we have. Um, it is the way um, forward. And we have launched uh, special um, programs to support that. And of course, um, pushing, um, the, the innovation agenda forward, you know, with the, of course, creation of the chief innovation officers back in 2015 um, across all our federal um, entities. Um, we also work um, towards building capabilities um, by offering a range of workshops and courses for different levels. So we're not just talking about the first level of the chief innovation officers, but we go into the different levels and um, ex expertise. Um, allow me to, to speak a bit about our Ibtekir platform. Um, and I hope in this session, uh, we all learn a new Arabic word. Ibtekir is innovate in Arabic. So Ibtekir platform is the first Arab platform for government innovation that aims to build a generation of Arab innovators. Um, we understand that we have a very special niche and a special uh, audience of Arabic speakers, which we believe um, um, creating and making available Arabic content about public sector innovation is key and important. 
So the platform includes interactive education and courses, a comprehensive knowledge-based um, database of global innovations, articles about government innovations, reports that are monitored globally um, and in the Arab world. And of course, we have most of our now courses subtitled in English um, to, make, to make available to. And as we all know, um, our government and many of us here um, have no patience and we wanna see results and we wanna see them faster. Um, so it is important to show early successes and if the case um, be, we might fail, then let's fail faster and move forward and learn from, from, from that um, 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 situation. So a crisis mode, um, and yes, we have um, a whole mentality of acceleration, um, frontline empowerment, leadership buy-in, the who's the right mix of team members, and create that permission and that space to innovate and make different solutions. And of course, my colleague Abdullah will be joining uh, the session next uh, in the conversation, who will be able to speak about it more. So the government accelerators um, is a methodology that became a product um, with many uh, uh, governments um, that, of course, my colleague Abdullah will be speaking about uh, further later. We also created a regulatory sandboxes to allow for legislators to work hand in hand with those that are disrupting legislations and co-writing future proof um, um, for laws. And of course, um, the UAE government also created the Ministry of Possibilities. Um, it's a first virtual ministry because we have, it's not just one minister leading it, but multiple leads, multiple ministers from the current cabinet lead nationwide um, priority portfolios in this space where we give permission to disrupt and ask the difficult questions and to incubate and solve the systemic impossibilities of our, um, of, of our government. Um, and having a space as the Ministry of Possibility, and of course, I'm privileged uh, personally to be part of this team, is how the UAE government was bold enough to actually announce such a ministry um, to experiment different incubation models, different um, setups of how do we disrupt, how do we ask uh, the tough questions that, that no one takes the responsibility and the lead to, to solve or, or answer. Um, again, it's about teaming up how do we come together as different agencies, entities, users, players, um, whether it was federal, local, private, um, individuals, academia. So this is the space that was actually created for that. Um, and since the second report sheds light on innovation through cross-border collaboration, um, surfacing insights and experimenting across borders, I'd like to take this opportunity and mention some examples led by the UAE here um, which we promoted um, the whole activity of cross-border collaboration is the Moonshot Apprenticeship Program. So a program that was launched by the UAE government in June, 2021, which united young minds, um, talents, and, and governments together to tackle the most pressing challenges of our time. The program of course paired UAE nationals with international counterparts to develop moonshot projects for the UAE under five priority sectors, which were, of course, data, economy, global talent, and global outreach. Um, we made that possible, and it was a physical apprenticeship program here that we hosted in, in the UAE. And the second program um, that was even launched was the Moonshot Pilot Grant. Um, an outcome of the Moonshot uh, program where um, it's a call for international community to test groundbreaking ideas in partnership with the UAE um, as, the, as the UAE counterpart in that project. So the fund could reach up to $100,000 per project. Um, so I invite you all um, to take part and of this opportunity 
And you know, the deadline has been set to November 28th, but please feel free to submit and, and log in. Um, and, I, and of course, we have Jeff Morgan with us today, which you know, he led one of our main pilots um, about um, anticipatory budgeting, of course. So this, this whole no, notion came through that, um, you know, being the center where we want to experiment and we want to explore those, those concepts. Um, if I may move to my next slide, if this allows me, yes. <laughs> so, um, as I said, these are the criteria. This is the moonshot pilot um, who could um, apply. What are the criteria? All clear on our um, and website. And last but not least, um, just wanted to share that the UAE joined six other nations in the Agile Nations Network to foster global cooperation on rulemaking in response to innovation. And of course, you may find more details in this initiative in, in the report. Um, and I would love to end um, this with, with the quote from His Highness, where he says, we believe innovation in government should be an everyday practice. Our vision is to be among the most innovative governments in the world. And um, I would want to like to thank you all for joining this session and being part of it and looking forward to the discussions ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sabir, for this uh, great overview of the accomplishment in the UAE. And I have to say that it's always very instructive to see how the UAE are really pushing the boundaries of what is possible, really trying to entrench innovation in the core of, the, of government and, and the public sector in, in general. Um, let's now get into the core of it. And um, you mentioned the, uh, the second report that's been issued today. Uh, I'm giving the floor to Jamie Barryhill, uh, that is uh, working in the observatory to provide an overview of the findings of that report on surfacing insights and experimenting across borders. Jamie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen quickly. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Marco and Abir and, uh, and Janos. Um, I well, want to get us really uh, straight to the discussion. So I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of our process on our second report. Um, and I'll, I'll add the link into the chat. Uh, I've done once already, and I'll add it again for folks who have joined, um, just to give you a sense of the work that we've been working on and, and how we're going to be carrying it into the future going forward. Um, so as mentioned, this is the, the second uh, in a series of reports on achieving cross-border government innovation that we've been doing in partnership with uh, the UAE Mohammed bin Rashid Center for Government Innovation. Um, so over the last year, we've been working together to uh, do a lot of research and analysis and data collection on different uh, methods and approaches governments are doing to innovate and, and do cross-border innovation in new and different ways. Um, so uh, the bulk of this, uh, our analysis has been focused on 104 case studies that we uh, identified through a global call for innovations crowdsourcing exercise. Um, we identified another 131 cases of interesting and innovative uh, uh, approaches to cross-border innovation uh, in the public sector uh, through research. And then we brought together uh, experts uh, who are participating in these projects uh, and who uh, volunteered through an open call to three different workshops that we held in June to really get at different aspects of cross-border uh, cross innovation and, and um, what challenges and success factors there might be and to uncover additional examples. Um, and last month uh, at our conference, uh, Government Beyond Recovery, we launched our first report in the series on governing cross-border challenges, which was really about govern governments putting in place the building blocks and foundations uh, and new governance mechanisms to, to be able to collaborate across borders. We talked about um, new types of governance bodies, uh, connecting countries transnationally, uh, ground up uh, or horizontal networks, as well as um, uh, new different types of innovative systems dynamics like co-governance and co-funding uh, across borders. Uh, and today we're really excited to launch our second report in the series on surfacing insights and experimenting across borders. So while the first report was really about top-down governance or horizontal networks. Um, and, and this report is really about uh, kind of the more ground-up approaches. So ground-up um, uh, 
for three different things. So one of them would be the ground up surfacing of insights and collective intelligence. So um, kind of taking some approaches that have already existed, but applying them in new uh, cross-border and even global ways. Um, so things like uh, challenge initiatives, things like crowdsourcing exercises, um, things like democratic uh, citizens assemblies, and really kind of raising the scope and doing a, a, something much larger than was done uh, in, in, in the past and taking a transnational approach to it. Uh, the two case studies we featured in this report, among dozens of other examples of really relevant and interesting cases um, that, uh, that Janos mentioned is the Deep Space Food Program, an international collaboration between NASA and the Canadian Space Program to uh, incentivize, incentivize innovators to come up with new ideas and solutions for um, food solutions for long-term uh, space travel, as well as things that could really improve the food systems on Earth. We're really excited to have uh, a representative here from NASA that Marco will introduce in just a moment uh, to, to talk about uh, her work in this area and, and uh, approaches to, to cross-border collaboration. Uh, our second case study in this was the Global Innovation Collaborative. Uh, so a network of cities across the, across the world from Paris to London to New York uh, and Berlin, um, working together to host uh, local challenges and, and, and uh, towards work, for now working towards COVID recovery and, and especially in the creative uh, sector uh, with ideas to scale beyond that over time. And we have uh, a representative here from the city of London as well, who's going to uh, discuss uh, the work in this project and then their efforts in uh, experiences in cross-border innovation. And then our second theme for this report, the second of two, we talked about experimenting and testing across border. So, so testing new ideas and finding different ways to scale things in a, in a cross-border way. Uh, and the case studies we featured in this report were was the 5G corridors or 5G Mobix case studies, which um, stretches across the EU uh, into China, into Turkey, trying to come up with uh, experimental ways to test automated, uh, automated vehicles uh, in different uh, atmospheres and different conditions, as well as the government accelerators uh, out of the United Arab Emirates. Um, and we also have someone who is here to speak about that work and how they're uh, accelerating projects in the, in the government there and, and doing um, uh, knowledge sharing on uh, how to move those forward. Some different key fit, uh, challenges and key success factors kind of uh, arose out of this particular material. Some of the key challenges being uh, cultural norms and, and lack of feedback mechanisms and learning loops, um, understanding the cost and benefits of the different cross-border partners, uh, a big one being undeveloped ecosystems, and then another one in finding ways to consider the scalability of these type projects, uh, especially in the design process and how they what success looks like, how, the, how it can be applied to other contexts. And then key success factors here, which often mirror the uh, key challenges showing how some of these are really make or break characteristics, um, being a, cu a culture of openness and innovation for, for, for the cases that we've seen that have done very well, agility and adaptability, um, understanding ecosystems and engaging diverse stakeholders, clearly defining roles and responsibilities, and kind of honing the, the, the role of cross-border facilitators or, or orchestrators or people kind of working in the center of the space who um, whose job is to build the relationships and, and, and bring people together. We have three high-level recommendations in this report that go along with three high-level, or excuse me, five high-level recommendations we had in the previous report. One is to encourage and, and develop the capacities for these facilitator orchestrator type roles. Uh, another one is mapping ecosystems and engaging the ecosystems players. Uh, a third one is iteration and learning. So, so building in kind of learning loops for these processes that uh, you can learn from yourself, that we can learn from each other. Um, scalable design. Uh, sometimes we look at projects that uh, are trying to scale, but it wasn't kind of a preconsidered notion uh, early in the process, and that those projects that are scaling up have thought about this a bit in advance. And then really just developing the formal mechanisms that, that some people are using, that countries are using to, to make this happen, the sandboxes, test beds, um, things like this, uh, is, is really just, you know, just doing it and, and trying to create these mechanisms that allow it to happen. Um, and of course, these are high-level recommendations. These things are easier said than done. They could apply to several different contexts. Um, so uh, in early 2022, we're going to be working uh, with experts uh, and, and practitioners on a playbook that helps to try to um, ground these high-level recommendations from these, this series of three reports uh, into something that can be a little bit more practical and, and hands-on for governments. 
Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you again for joining us. If you would like to see the reports, they're at this URL that I'll add to the chat. Um, and with that, Marco, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, thanks a lot for, for this presentation. There will, there will be a lot of uh, um, picked up uh, items in your presentation that we can use it for, for the conversation going forward. Uh, before we move uh, forward, just uh, let me let me say that we're sorry. We understand that there have been some uh, audio issues and you might not have heard all the, the presentations well. We're, we're working on it and ho hopefully we'll fix it uh, along the way. Now, uh, thanks, Jamie, for this. Uh, let me introduce the, the panelists uh, that, that we have for this conversation, starting uh, with Sir Jeff Morgan, Professor of Collective Intelligence, Public Policy and Social Innovation at the University College London, QCL. Thank Jeff for, for joining us. Abdullah Al Jarwan, a Senior Project Manager of the Government Accelerators Program in the United Arab Emirates. Jen Gustatic, Director of Early Stage Partnership and Innovation at NASA. Thank Jen and Abdullah for, for being and joining us. And finally, Theo Blackwell, who's the Chief Digital Officer at the Office of the Mayor of London. Thanks also, Theo, for joining us for this conversation. Thank you all. And uh, perhaps I'm, I'm intrigued to see the results of the, of the pool, if someone can put them up and we can perhaps use it and reflect on that as we kickstart this, this conversation. Um, I'll, uh, I think that we, we can just start with a, a short introductions uh, of, uh, of yourself. Um, and perhaps what I want to hear starting from, from Jeff, how does your work relate to the, the topic that we are, we are discussing today? If you can tell us a bit about your experience in cross-border, in collaborating across borders, and if you uh, see anything that really surprised you in this results uh, of the pool that I that has been shown uh, up now, uh, we can see that there's basically the highest challenge or the most felt barriers is underdeveloped ecosystems to cross border collaboration. Uh, Jeff, your reflection, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Marco, and I'm very glad you're doing this project and I enjoyed writing the preface for it because I'm sure this field is going to become uh, more important. And I think the most striking thing about it is the contrast between the emergent projects and methods you've described blocked by cultural and other barriers and what we take for granted in other fields. So I'm based in a university, I'm in an engineering department in science and engineering Almost everything now is global and collaborative. There is shared collective intelligence of the underlying data, experimental results. Most projects involve teams in many, many countries as a matter of course. And this is normal for the everyday life of scientists. And you could say the governments have learned that it's just more efficient to pool the costs of experiments and research and also pool the benefits uh, unlike perhaps the patterns 100 or 150 years ago when most of the work would have been done within uh, national boundaries. And we've seen this in the last 18 months very visibly with COVID, uh, the previous work of Gavi, the work of vaccine development, all of which involve many countries, the work of COVAX. And so the question in a way is why, why is this not more normal in other fields? Why do governments not more normally collaborate to experiment perhaps with schools, new methods of maths teaching or policing or public health or you know, reducing uh, carbon emissions in neighborhoods. Um, and there's a contrast as well between, I think what is now quite efficient methods of evidence orchestration. Part of my work now at UCL is running IPO, the International Public Policy Observatory on COVID where we pull together global evidence and experience on things like care during COVID. And the OECD has done you know, fantastic work over the, the years of this kind of pulling together of global knowledge and collective intelligence. But there's much less collaborative experiment to generate the new evidence. We're mainly gathering material from individual national uh, projects, policies, and so on. So that's why I, mean, I found this report so fascinating, as, as Jamie was saying, projects from you know, space food to cities to banking. There is a small emerging sector of organizations doing more of this. Uh, Jay Powell in Poverty and Development 
In my last job at Nestra, I used to run the Innovation Growth Lab, about 12 governments pooling funding for experiments on business support. The UNDP Accelerator Labs in nearly 100 countries uh, are, are doing parallel experiments, but it's still a very emergent field. And I think as the report shows, there are sort of high barriers and transaction costs. Each is almost done as a one-off. It's not quite clear whose job it is to do this. In science, there are well-established disciplines, journals, funder norms, things like the Horizon programs in Europe. We don't quite have the equivalents uh, in this field. And within national governments, the UAE is obviously an exception very few governments have stable roles, structures, and funding streams, even for innovation within their own countries, let alone for this kind of uh, collaboration. And yet, and this is perhaps a final point to make, in lots and lots of fields, we are seeing the emergence of what is sometimes called minilateralism. The multilateral global, in global organizations often struggle to have legitimacy or capability to solve problems. And yet the national level is clearly too small. So lots of different collaborations of groups of countries around different tasks. And this field of innovation is bound to be an important space for minilateralism. And the more OECD and others can do to reduce the frictions, reduce the transaction costs, the better for all of us, I think. Thanks a lot, Jeff. And I want to pick up on, on one of your points about uh, tickling barriers to cross-border collaboration and perhaps going to, to Jen and see how that looks like in, a, in your context at, at NASA. Now, is it really about one virus after the others that no, no one has responsibility for that? How do you perceive that from your, from your standpoint, from the project that you're, you're leading? Yeah, thank you. And um, Jeff, just so many things I could riff off of, of what you just said. Always um, great, great remarks. Um, and thank you for having um, uh, me and NASA today to talk a little bit about deep space food, but also uh, how we think about some of these topics um, at the agency. So as you noted, I'm the director for early stage innovation and partnerships uh, for NASA. That In that capacity, I uh, lead roughly a $350 million research and development portfolio annually. Uh, where we invest in universities, small businesses, prize competitions and challenges, as well as our own internal uh, lab workforce in order to develop technologies and research uh, to empower the next generation of aeronautics and space uh, travel and science for NASA. And so we really harness a broad ecosystem of innovators, uh, primarily domestically focused, but not all domestically focused, uh, in order to advance uh, priorities related to NASA's mission. And so one thing I just wanted to pick up on, on what Jeff said um, around, um, he, he didn't use exactly this language, but uh, it's, it's the language I use, which is innovation can sometimes feel like hand-to-hand -hand combat each time. <laughs> so as, as, as one project manager is getting started with a new way of business, uh, they're having to negotiate with the attorneys, with public affairs, with the chief information officer shop, with, and sometimes feeling um, like they're doing that alone without a support structure uh, to do that. Um, and so part of my goal leading innovation uh, for my portion of NASA, but also in various roles that I played at the White House um, and uh, in other kind of innovation areas over the course of my career, is to try to uh, reduce the barriers to innovation uh, with every intervention that I can help uh, take in order to scale innovation approaches within the government. Um, and uh, I've done this through not only uh, prizes and challenges, but also through small business innovation research programs, uh, as well as uh, maker communities of practice and design thinking communities. And I'm working with a lot of these ecosystems, right? Folks that work on prizes, folks that work on, on maker, the maker movement, um, folks that are embracing design principles. Um, we really discovered a number of kind of strategies that are important to scale those approaches across organizational agency and even um, uh, uh, borders um, in order to scale more use of those approaches. And uh, I've written more about this and I'll share a link uh, about to it as well, but that really there's kind of eight key elements to, uh, and they don't have to be done in any particular order, but uh, eight key elements that you have to address in order to create ecosystems and scale innovations in a way that's sustainable. Um, one being the legal and policy frameworks that you are 
uh, operating in and not assuming that those are static. You can actually uh, change the law in your country um, through legislative proposals and through um, uh, other other mechanisms, depending on where you're located. Uh, but sometimes it does take a legal change, like it did in the US with prizes and challenges to scale prizes and challenges, as well as citizen science. We had to actually work to get new laws passed um, in order to enable that. Uh, second piece is shared infrastructure and common platforms. The impact of uh, uh, platforms like challenge.gov, uh, data.gov, and other kind of shared platforms that allow people a place to go um, to get started without it costing them a lot to get started, and also a one-stop shop for the public is really, really uh, valuable, valuable to scaling. Third area is in the emergence and sustainability of communities of practice, connecting people to one another that want to learn um, at various points in the process and really supporting those communities. It was great to see some of the things that UAE is doing uh, with some of that kind of train the trainer uh, methodologies and kind of building their innovation um, ecosystem and capacity within the government. Um, the, the fourth is budgets. So I hear a lot, um, you know, when you pilot, when you budget for a pilot, budget assuming it's going to succeed, right? That doesn't mean that you don't evaluate it and experiment and understand whether or not it's useful to move forward or to scale it potentially differently. But if you don't actually budget for it to succeed, you could lose a year or two in a budget cycle, not having the actual budget to scale it um, because you only budgeted for a pilot in one year. So be thinking about ongoing resources and budgeting. And then the final three that I won't go into much are uh, really taking on those agency processes that can create a lot of barriers, um, uh, as well as um, reporting requirements that kind of keep you honest about the results that you're seeing and force you to think quantitatively and qualitatively. And finally, external assessments and impact studies, really the role of taking a, uh, a real evaluation mindset to what you're doing. And even though it might not always come out rosy, um, what the impacts are that teaches you um, and how you can actually have better impacts um, the next time. And so we really embrace those principles across a lot of the innovation communities across the US federal government and uh, within NASA. And we've seen scaling of a lot of those approaches as a result. And I hope to be able to talk a little bit more about deep space food a bit later, which is kind of one example of the methods that, that we use to scale um, innovation and reach the public in our work. Thanks a lot, Jen. Thanks. This is really interesting. And I'll, I'll uh, perhaps want to stay a bit on the bias questions and the, uh, the results of the poll and perhaps turn it to Theo. Um, you are leading uh, one of this project that we have covered extensively in our report, Global Innovation Collaborative. And um, if you can tell us a bit what you're trying to achieve with that uh, and uh, what type of barriers you're encountering, in fact, to, to get it into uh, life and, uh, and, and thrive. In, in your space. Well, well, thanks very much, Marco. Uh, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with this um, uh, high level audience to talk about this very important issue. And I couldn't do my job as Chief Digital Officer for London without uh, a strong foundation and emphasis and political commitment to collaboration. Um, that's partly because London is um, where I sit in City Hall, we're a strategic authority, kind of like a regional authority in the European sense. And we have to collaborate with all of our London boroughs and we have to collaborate with government uh, departments. We can't just go it alone. And a fundamental part of my work from day one, which was about four years ago as, as the first Chief Digital Officer London's appointed, um, was to reach out to other cities and to see what we could work on together. Now, up to the crisis, this has been focused more on what I call fixing the plumbing, uh, in that uh, not every city has got uh, data innovation, um, engagement with the tech community, the fundamental infrastructure 100% right. But each city brings together an area of expertise. And where we all have limited resource, we can learn from each other. Um, and a particularly fertile field at the moment uh, has been working with European cities under the GDPR framework on um, what's called Cities Coalition for Digital Rights, where we're exploring the ethical foundations we need to innovate responsibly using AI. And that's totally invaluable. So the background, I would say, to city to city and international collaboration has been that fixing the plumbing, like learning the common methodologies um, and learning from each other. 
Now, during the crisis, we needed much more uh, immediate action. And this is where we uh, started to create the, uh, the network between Berlin and Paris, uh, London and New York, uh, supported by Bloomberg Associates. And this was the Creative Cities Challenge. And we focused on uh, an open call uh, around the creative and cultural sector, because each of our cities have uh, an amazing cultural offer. And during the lockdowns, it was this part of the economy that was being particularly punished. So we shared this as large cities um, with a historic cultural offer. And its aim is uh, to spotlight innovations and to reinforce the multi-city international collaboration that existed before the pandemic um, with a specific boost to that sector and particularly the use of technology and digital platforms um, that could help the sector uh, on the way out. So at the moment, we're actually in judging mode and we're down to the last uh, 15. The winner will be announced uh, uh, shortly. But platforms that are being considered are ones that support artists, uh, support um, other aspects of the theatre and uh, cultural sector, um, new payment mechanisms, the use of augmented and virtual reality in new settings. And I would say one thing about our experience with open calls, because of course everybody focuses on the winner if you've got a prize uh, and a competition, um, and it's right that they do, but a, a secondary um, benefit of an open call process is exposing an element of our um, of our public sector, um, you know, in this case, the, the the cultural team and all of those involved, with what's out there. Show them the art of the possible. So even though an idea might not win, we get the benefit and the takeaway of showing the potential of the technology that's out there for the future. So I think they are also very very good at showcasing the ideas and. If we pivot in the future um, from cultural industries to things like how do we retrofit um, all of our housing stock uh, in, in London, a, a very, very massive task, you'd be looking at an open call and the learning going into the housing sector. And the same applies to transport and social care and the other things. So I think that that open call approach is extremely valuable, not just for the end product, but the learning by doing. That's a lot to you, and it's uh, a very good point on the value of uh, bringing other views, perspectives in, because we can learn a lot from, uh, from what others are doing, but also, you know, uh, showcasing really what uh, what is at stake in uh, in this engagement process and uh, and seeing them as a value per se. Uh, now, Abdullah, you, you have um, played a, a very strong role in the government exchange program, which uh, the previous presentation have hinted to which has this um, focus on facilitating knowledge sharing across borders, to, especially to other countries. Now, why, why this activity has been focused on that? What, can, you, can you share your insight uh, on what you have learned and why it's so important to you? Sure, thank you, Marco. Well, I start from uh, Adir's presentation, actually. Uh, she, she mentioned that uh, we'll be celebrating the Golden Jubilee of the country next week here in the UAE, so that's the 50 year uh, birthday of the country. So speaking of back to 1971, when the UAE was first established, one of the main principles of the country back then, and it keeps growing day after day, and it's also part of the 10 principle for the next uh, 50 years is actually the international collaboration, uh, the assistance from the UAE to different countries in the globe, regardless of uh, the relation with the UAE, their location. So we have this uh, culture of sharing basically, whether it is uh, monetary, non-monetary, financially, and uh, it's, it's really obliged from the uh, leadership of our country to showcase our best practices and uh, to actually share with the friendly countries and brotherly countries of the UAE. Uh, so the government exchange program is really nothing but a continuation of the country's effort of mutual collaboration with different countries, with the culture of giving and stuff. 
Uh, so back to the UAE government, you know, based on the uh, vision of the UAE government as being a citizen-centric uh, government here in the country, focusing on delivering the best practices, the best services to the citizens, to the residents of the country. Uh, therefore, we're having a lot of, uh, as mentioned in the presentation, a lot of, I would say, proudly UAE tailored and made services, such as the government accelerator, where, which I represent in the government exchange program. Other services, such as the Excellence Award, the government services. So please, if you could allow me just to elaborate further on the government accelerator. So this is the tool which take, take us from ideation, innovation, to not only execution, but accelerating execution. Uh, and we really have seen a lot here in the country, you know, with the government accelerator methodology, how could we accelerate uh, deliver, delivering of uh, strategic uh, agenda of the country. A lot of challenges has been uh, resolved through the, throughout this one. And we really proudly could say that we really developed something that we are really proud of, you know, and we see the tangible uh, effect to the citizen. And then again, back to the uh, vision of the leadership, to the direction of the country, we happily share this knowledge with other countries for a lot of reasons. So one which I've covered basically is a continuation of the international collaboration with the countries across the globe. Second, basically, it's an opportunity for us. So it's not only a one-way offering, you know, a knowledge sharing between UAE and X country or that country or so. It's actually another way around, you know, it's testing of our tools that has proven, proven their success here in the country with our own specific government uh, formulation and stuff. So it's really great to see their effect in different types of governments in the world. So we've worked with different uh, countries, you know, with uh, uh, republics, uh, with the democratic countries, with the different countries of the world. And we really feel proud, you know, to see the success of our unique methodology. Again, I'll speak about the government accelerator with different parts of the world. And it's always, uh, uh, it, it, it offers us uh, a great opportunity to enhance our services, our tools, etc. So in a nutshell, this is really basically why are we supporting other countries? It's basically back to the real commitment of our country to just support other countries. And then the second thing is it's across uh, culture. You know, here in the UAE, you proudly say that we have people from 200 nationalities. So actually the formation of the country has been depending on a lot of knowledge that we have attracted from overseas you now. So it's now the time for the UAE to share, I would say, our knowledge and acknowledge uh, the success of this uh, story with other countries as well. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Abdullah, for, the, for this. Uh, now, I, I want to go down uh, perhaps uh, something that is uh, surfaced in your, in your responses, in your intervention, which is the idea of uh, the power of grounded up uh, innovation. And uh, collective intelligence and policies. Now, why are so, this concept is particularly important for policymakers and how does prefer a connect to innovating across borders? So I think there's two, two different dimensions of meaning here, uh, both of which have been mentioned by the other speakers. The first in some ways is a very simple idea that the most creative ideas or insights probably won't come from within your organization. So the more you can harvest knowledge from anywhere, as Jen and NASA have been doing for many years, as Theo is describing, uh, using open challenges, and as the Moonshot Apprenticeship is doing in UAE, this is a quite different way of thinking about problem solving, where you assume that the greatest idea will not be in a top university or within the bureaucracy or necessarily in a big company, and you use discovery processes to, to find them. And there are now, hundreds of different methods for doing this, open innovation platforms, collective intelligence platforms, uh, platforms linking farmers, perhaps linking teachers, which mobilize brain power in much more efficient ways using the internet. 
Most governments still don't use these methods, I should say. They are still, you know, novel to most officials, uh, but I'm absolutely certain this will just become common sense in the fairly near, near future. And the second meaning of collective intelligence is what you then do with the knowledge you gain. As I said, in the worlds of science or medicine, as a matter of course, new discoveries in vaccines or surgical procedures are documented. They're put in journals, they're put in databases, they're embedded in training of the new professionals. There are people whose job it is to organize all of that knowledge. There are people whose job it is to gather the data, not just from successful experiments, but from unsuccessful experiments, because that makes the whole system more intelligent. Again, this, we're beginning to get bits of that in the public sector and public policy, but on a far smaller scale than is normal in, as I say, engineering or medicine or new materials or even space science. And I think the task for the next 10 years is really to use the fact we have the extraordinary capabilities of the internet, the web and data to organize collective intelligence in both of these senses and just make them part of how we do all our business. And, both the, the, the versions I've described are of their nature cross-border. They don't respect the boundaries either of nations, but or of bureaucracies and organizations. And what's key is mobilizing and harnessing intelligence wherever you can find it and then orchestrating it so it becomes useful. Sorry, Marco, have you disappeared? <laughs> I think we've lost Marco possibly from our screens. Uh, <clears throat> and I mean, maybe just one other comment or James. I mean, it was very interesting hearing Theo talking about the creative economy uh, and his, his project with the other cities. Um, I remember 25 years ago being part of a, a network of cities working on the creative economy and creative clusters, but then, it was very, in some ways, traditional. It was just a club which shared experiences, talked about what wasn't or wasn't working. Uh, cities like Barcelona, Helsinki, London, and Berlin. Now it can be much more systematic and structured with shared budgets, with shared learning, with much more you know, constant interaction and peer learning between, between the projects. And that to me is a really exciting development, the world cities becoming much more like a true global collective intelligence using tools which weren't available for those previous creative city networks back in, in the 90s. Thank you very much, Jeff. And I'll, I'll step in for Marco for a minute while I think he tries to reconnect. Um, uh, so uh, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about ecosystems and, and we've covered ecosystems quite a bit and uh, the, 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 you know, the uh, ground up uh, surfacing ground up insights, you know, uh, and uh, collective intelligence really involves tapping into these ecosystems. So I'd like to learn a little bit more about your thoughts and approaches to um, first understanding your ecosystem and then learning how to like activate and really um, lean into these ecosystem players to try to bring about um, uh, the most, you know, the most uh, important insights and, and ideas and approaches. Um, Jen, do you mind if we pass it over to you to, to learn about your approach at NASA? Sure, um, I'll take a first, first jump at that one. Um, I'd say that there's a potentially a few different ways to think about ecosystems, both vertically and horizontally. Um, and there's probably a whole other ways of directionally approaching an ecosystem. But um, uh, much of my experience uh, and a lot of the organizing experience in the US around innovation methods has been around some horizontal groupings. Right, so communities of practice and ecosystems around prize competitions, communities of practice and ecosystems around citizen science. Um, and the players who care about those different methods um, can look very different both inside and outside of government. For example, in citizen science, there's an incredibly active uh, academic community uh, that's been experimenting and using citizen science approaches for over a hundred years. Um, the annual bird watch is something I think that just uh, recently hit its 100 year anniversary of folks going out and doing an annual bird count, citizen science going out and doing an annual bird count, which gives us information about migratory patterns and uh, different types of animals in a record that's very different than other sources of data that we have. But there's that kind of uh, horizontal ecosystem uh, way of thinking about uh, 
identifying not only who is interested in there, but what their interests are in that particular method. Uh, and how then you incentivize and grow that particular ecosystem of practitioners um, is a very different question than vertical ecosystems where, for example, you might be looking at how to build a um, uh, ecosystem of uh, climate change uh, related um, entities that are interesting and interested in taking on a particular moonshot uh, challenge, which could be a grand challenge, could be some large program, you know, could be related to horizons or missions as, as Dr. Mazakudo uh, also in, um, in Europe is speaking about. Um, and the way that you build those coalitions and build those ecosystems that are more mission focused um, will look slightly differently, different than the way that you build an ecosystem around, around something that's more method focused. And so I just say that you kind of need to know going in what type of problem you're taking on, what type of capacity you're trying to build and to customize your approach that based on, you know, really having a deep understanding of the problem or the method uh, that you're trying to advance. Um, and it's not a one size fits all, uh, fits all approach. Thank you very much, Jen. And and I'm, cu I'm curious to hear about the kind of similar perspective from Teo coming from a, a portfolio like NASA and switching gears a bit to, to a, a city level portfolio like London and working with the different councils and bureaus, uh, boroughs and um, and, and then also the, the, the side project with working with the Global Innovation Challenge and, and thinking about these different players. I'm curious, uh, what role do you see ecosystems playing in, in cross-border innovation or cross-jurisdictional innovation even if within the same country? And are there certain key players that you think are the most important to, to be collaborating with? Well, absolutely. Um, and uh, the first thing I did, um, when I, I became chief digital officer was uh, set up a organization called the London Office of, of Technology and Innovation, uh, which is uh, led by uh, Eddie Copeland. And that has been transformational in London and a real illustration of how a small team of less than 10 people can have a completely outsized impact if you if you bring in the right team to organize and curate and work really really closely using design thinking and bringing data expertise um with a particular ecosystem and that particular ecosystem was london's 32 boroughs so it helped to bring organization create a foundation for much uh more fruitful engagement with that ecosystem that had really ever happened before. So there are currently about 20 or 30 projects working on sprints with local authorities, everything from understanding our uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure through to using I Internet of Things technology in social care. So really, really exciting uh, work there. And it makes me think um, and reflect on something that someone said uh, at a conference uh, uh, the other day, I think it was a minister from from Norway, he said uh, that, 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 you know, people talk about the next big thing as being AI or 5G that's going to be transformational, but in fact it's collaboration and getting the methodology of collaboration, entering an era of collaboration is going to be more transformational than perhaps some of these, uh, some of the technologies that people talk about. Um, but I just wanted to reflect on one thing, um, uh, which was, I mean, our, our journey in London, if we looked about a specific vertical, um, which is data, um, London's always been good in, in the field of um, open data from London Day Store in 2010 to Transport for London's open API, live feeds of transport data. And it's really interesting about how we in a sense, our openness right at the start champ was championed so much that we didn't engage with the ecosystem. So when we rethink how our city data sharing works, how our city data platform works uh, 10 years on, um, we realized that just by having a, and championing open publication meant that we were actually quite far away from the ecosystem. We were so open we didn't know who our users were. And so when we rebuild our data store uh, that will provide the data fueling a lot of our innovation in the future, we need to do so, one, on the principles that we still champion open data, but two, that we can't do it in such a passive way that we lose our users. 
that we need to build them into the governance. We need to use uh, open calls around data and really engage uh, data users from universities to business uh, to civil society to the public sector in how we do things. So that curation piece and having um, the people there to help us curate, for example, the London Office of Technology and Innovation is really, really important. You can't just be kind of uh, a, a uh, passive enabler here. You have to invest in the right teams to get the most out of that ecosystem, excite them, build momentum, make it easy for them uh, to engage with you. Thank you, Theo. And uh, as someone whose job it is to uh, learn about interesting things going on um, and, and great examples that should be shared, uh, you, you make it easy from London. So uh, we, we, Thank you. we like what you're doing. Uh, and and um, Jen, I believe you wanted to, to loop back uh, into this question to talk about um, space apps and uh, deep space program. Yeah, I just wanted to give a, a couple uh, tangible examples of ecosystem building um, at that kind of vertical and horizontal um, uh, level that I had mentioned um, that are also global that cross boundaries to give you an example of kind of what uh, what that framework I laid out could look like. So. Kind of on on the and this builds off of what um, Theo was just saying about it's not just about making the data open but building ecosystems around that data. Um, one of the uh, uh, activities that NASA launched actually ten years ago today we celebrated our ten year anniversary um, this year was the International Space Apps Challenge, and that is a very much kind of a horizontally focused ecosystem building activity in that it postulates if we put out our data, um, our software, and a variety of different um, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, tools that uh, innovators across the globe can build off of that we could solve challenges uh, at scale globally in a way that uh, uh, we wouldn't be able to through more traditional methods. And so we're on our 10th year of running the International Space Apps Challenge. Uh, and this past year, 28,000 people from across the globe participated in that 48 hour uh, hackathon from across 162 countries where cities um, step up and volunteer to, to host a space apps challenge in their city. Uh, and we pose what NASA will do oftentimes with partners is come up with challenge statements, uh, make sure that the data is available, the open source software is available, and uh, kind of give folks a, a way to channel kind of their energy and their, pro and their prototyping of solutions. And this year they tackled 28 projects uh, or 28 challenges and came up with just shy of 3000 projects globally. I have personally participated in several space apps, uh, flew to Australia for one, uh, one year, and to just see the energy around the globe that people feel uh, when they're not just communicated to about the work of, uh, uh, of NASA, but feel like they have a meaningful way to engage in that work. It's incredible to see the energy uh, and the empowerment uh, that comes as a result of that activity, but that's around the Kind of horizontal ecosystem building activity. People come because they want to use their data and their coding chops, right, or their maker chops, and that's what they feel like they can bring. They may have not had any tie to space, but they know something about data, and they have a computer, and you know they can also you know put together use a three D printer, right? And so they're going to come over for a weekend and see how they can apply that to a space challenge. Um, Deep space food, which I know was in your um, report. Um, is really an example of kind of a vertical ecosystem building. We know we have a challenge related to uh, sustainable uh, sources of food uh, when we're on long duration space missions. And this challenge sought to bring together kind of a coalition of people working on food challenges that might not necessarily have focused their energy on space food challenges, even though uh, space food challenges uh, have applications for sure uh, for food availability um, on Earth. And so Recognizing that this was a uh, kind of a challenge area that was really important to space, uh, uh, NASA and CSA, the Canadian Space Agency, identified that these were mutually, uh, this is a mutual challenge. This was something that both countries were interested in pursuing, both space agencies were interested in pursuing. And um, it was the first time NASA's actually approached doing a prize competition uh, with cash on the line. Uh, for space apps, there's no, no money. Like there's other, it's, it's much more intrinsic uh, reasons why people participate, why they come for the weekend. But for our Centennial Challenges program, we typically offer a prize for a, a, a large cash prize purse. And since was, this was our first time collaborating with another country to do it, and we do have some kind of legal and policy restrictions about who we can make financial awards to, 
um, with uh, US appropriated funds, we had to work on developing basically parallel prize competitions. And so um, each uh, government organizes their own challenge, very similar challenge, they're co-marketed, um, but each has a co, uh, each has distinct rules, eligibility, um, but a lot of activities are synchronized. So we announced together, for example, uh, in October, when we announced our 18 teams that won the phase one challenge, as well as 10 international competitors that aren't getting funding or uh, prize funding, but are getting um, elevation of their solutions by being announced as top 10 international teams. Um, we kind of announced our phase one winners together. And we just did a really cool webinar on November 15th that engaged celebrities, including Martha Stewart, um, astronauts like Scott Kelly and Chris Hadfield from Canada, as well as NASA senior leadership, the CSA president, um, and a variety of other folks to kind of co-market to different communities. And so uh, we figured out how to run a parallel competition that was still within our legal constructs, but to kind of collaborate on the marketing and the outreach. And it's been amazing to see um, the energy around various communities globally around helping us to find uh, challenges or solutions to this challenge that not only address uh, serious food um, concerns in space, but also could help to address issues here right, uh, on Earth. Thank you, and really showing how uh, it really can be done. Um, and I think that that's a really nice example um, for, for the audience to be able to hear about. I'd like to shift gears just a little bit, and I'm going to save some time uh, towards the end for some questions from the audience. But I, I'd also like to talk a little bit about um, how, to, how to kind of move beyond um, uh, the initial piloting and ideas. Uh, and so, so our, this whole report that we have right now is about surfacing insights and experimenting across borders, which can be uh, a first step or first several steps, but implementing those learnings and taking what you've learned and changing, really changing kind of existing processes and structures or creating new processes and structures to, to accommodate them seems to be kind of a, a challenging next step. So whether that's scaling up, whether it's backing in to new ways of doing things based on what you've learned from these small tests and what you've learned from ground up solutions, um, I think is, is kind of like the next level that we need to be looking at. Maybe Abdullah, I, I'm curious to hear about, um, about your work. And I believe that you're, it involves kind of a hundred day challenge. And at that hundred, end of that hundred days, towards the end, there's a, a scaling process that uh, there's a strategy for scaling and then an implementation. I'd love to know about how you take your efforts to the next step. Sure, thank you, Jamie, for this question. Well, basically, as mentioned, you know, the government accelerator, it's really from innovation, uh, innovative ideas from uh, experimenting to implementation, actually accelerated uh, implementation. Uh, so as we noticed, the 100 days or less, you know, so 100 days is like the cap uh, for implementing. The beauty of it, it's like piloting the innovative solutions because uh, by empowering the frontliner employees from the relevant entities, we really focus a lot on the stakeholder building as well. Uh, so we don't work with a uh, single entity or so. We really focus on collaborative work, having uh, the right mix of people from the different entities, the frontline employees, empowering them through our unique uh, governance model that we really apply. And then we actually solve a specific challenge on a pilot phase uh, basis and during the 100 days uh, uh, area duration. And uh, basically, as you mentioned, the, towards the very end of the 100 days journey, the whole focus will be on setting the sustainability team, how to sustain this innovative uh, solution that has pro proven its success, you know, we've really piloted it, we've implemented it on a specific uh, geographical area or a specific service. And then the whole focus would be on how to sustain it on this specific area service and how to scale it up to different uh, similar areas, to, to different geographical areas. So we've been doing it here in the UE for the past five years now here and then, and we're following the same methodology and approach while doing uh, working with our colleagues in uh, different countries of the world who are applying the 100 days methodology. So it's all again, and just to sum it up, it's all about collaboration uh, and uh, setting real targets and take it forward, you know, uh, as a day-to-day -day, uh, work operation within the lead entities working with us, basically. 
Thank you very much, Abdullah. I'm curious about your thoughts on the same question, Jeff. You've seen and seen and been involved in a lot of different efforts, many different stages of maturity. What are some ways that you see are, are uh, like success factors or, or ways to scale up, ways to um, uh, take the learnings from collective intelligence and, and, and ground up efforts and, and spin them into something uh, sustainable? Well, I certainly endorse all that's been said, including the value of sprints of really pushing a sense of urgency for a 90 day or 100 days as part of a longer term process, because it, it usually then takes more time to, to implement. Um, I mean, my, my short answer is perhaps a bureaucrat's answer, but this is where bureaucracy actually is essential, as well as getting rid of bureaucracy. I mean, most things happen when it becomes part of someone's job, when it becomes institutionalized. And I mentioned earlier vaccines, but I mean, vaccines are so much part of our lives now. It's, it's not a bad example. I mean, 20 years ago, Gavi was created to get global collaboration on vaccine development because it wouldn't happen unless it was institutionalized. It became part of people's jobs. Budgets were pulled together. You know, science was basically mobilized. And then with COVAX, a distribution mechanism. And I think that's what we're missing. And that's what maybe we could work on collaboratively next year or two on things like net zero, you know, how do cities and nations really achieve their goals on decarbonizing, retrofitting old houses, neighborhood energy and so on. There's a huge amount to be done, which needs lots of parallel experiments, rigorous measurement of what works, quick learning from what works and sharing that. The same in things like public health, how do we get fitness in all our cities? So you know, everyone is doing 10 or 20 percent more, more daily exercise. Again, we don't quite know the answer. So you have to have a discovery process, open challenges which bring in the best ideas, but then structured experiments to test them out and gather the data and the evidence and share them. This In the past, the OECD, as I said earlier, has done bits of this, things like labor markets, Lots of experiments around you know, how to get people uh, ready for new jobs, but we simply lack the institutions to do this on most of the really important things of the next 10 years, like net zero, like education, like health, like poverty and inequality. And we need some institution building to allow this to happen at scale, mobilizing you know, all the creativity which there is out there. Uh, and at the moment, we would essentially throw away our collective intelligence. <laughs> Most of the time, we waste it, we let it dissipate, and future generations will be a bit, sh bit shocked how casual and careless we are with, with what is probably our most valuable set of resources. Thank you, Jeff. And I, I want to take a little bit of time to go over some questions from the audience. Um, so we have a question from Pritam Harimam, Harimun. Uh, it says, what role would you say culture has on the development of, of innovation ecosystems and cross-border collaboration? And what would you uh, and what would you we learn about the influence of culture when uh, what needs to innovate are high? So when the needs to innovate are high, such as during a pandemic. So it's kind of the culture question. And uh, this was uh, this really shown through uh, through the whole report. The, the, the biggest challenges were culture for projects that didn't have it to start with. And the biggest success factors uh, for projects were uh, culture of uh, culture of innovation for uh, projects that did have it. Um, Teo, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the, the culture question. And, and apologies if I keep saying Teo, if it's Theo. I, I've lived in France for, for too long for okay. it's Teo automatically by now. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's Theo. Um, so, um, I, I mean, culture and posture is extremely important. And I'll just reflect on this from a, from a London perspective, because the received wisdom was when you were trying to get bits of London, so, some of which have, have, have sort of tangentially see themselves as part of the city, the sort of further out you go, um, you try and get people to, to work together. And, and the received wisdom was um, you've got to do things right across the board. Um, so you try and do things on a 32 borough basis because then you'll get scale. And that is more important than anything else. But of course, if not everyone has the same perspective, it creates friction. So we consciously set out, and you know, it, it, you go back about 10 years and people were talking about 
uh, you know, innovation will come if you share lots of services together. And what, what, what actually happened there is they became overgoverned entities, too much legalese, you know, the promised low hanging fruit, especially with the introduction of technology, didn't really occur. And they actually become quite unwieldy and expensive. So our approach to collaboration in London um, took a, uh, a different stance. It said, um, who of these authorities um, ascribes to a certain set of principles? And those are the principles we de developed uh, with um, some people who used to work for the government digital service, effectively embeds the uh, agile methodology in municipal government. And we said, those that agree with this approach, come over here, um, stump up a bit of money, we will as well. And we created the London Office of Technology and Innovation. So in a sense, we said, who wants to be in the classroom? And um, it's not to say that, that people outside of that, that group uh, don't benefit from what we do, but we specifically wanted to talk to a group. And we created momentum. We, we created a, um, a group of people where it was like basically cool to join. And so now you have a situation where more uh, parts of London are joining this because there's a bit of FOMO. There's like fear of missing out here um, because something cool is happening uh, over there. And so our door is always open to those that want to join, but we created a certain cultural um, uh, sort of uh, a bar almost. And that was based around the principles that we want to see in well-designed public services. You go over that bar, you're part of the group, work with us and gain the benefits. And the benefits aren't just ones that are kind of financial or in terms of effectiveness, it's also motivational for that group. So by creating that movement, we had a ripple effect, we think, across London. Thank you, Theo. And Jenna, I'm curious if you could provide a few thoughts on culture as well. And then we have a, a specific question for you. Um, where we have Quentin Wilson is curious if you think that the, the NASA challenge approach could be applied towards community social impact challenges, uh, and, uh, especially around the statement of being energized by people um, having a meaningful way in, to engage in the work. Um, and, and maybe this goes back to even some of your experiences uh, in doing prizes and challenges at the White House for other types of uh, efforts. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, you're absolutely right, Jamie. I think more of the prizes and challenges approaches that I have seen that have applied to um, uh, different non kind of technical um, challenges or outcomes um, have been uh, in my time um, while I was at the White House. And actually one of the challenges that came to mind um, that uh, I was thinking about um, uh, when one of the other panelists was speaking was a challenge that was actually led by Georgetown University. So not even one that was uh, led by the federal government uh, that was around um, clean, uh, trying to um, uh, identify methods that worked in medium sized cities for reducing to try to get to zero closer to zero emissions uh, at the city level and they specifically focused on uh, medium sized cities because the large sized cities were getting a lot of attention, but the medium sized cities might have the resources available to be able to start to prototype some of those approaches. And it was kind of like a this might be a very US centric reference it was kind of like an NCAA style tournament style model of identifying kind of regional leaders um, and winners, um, and not necessarily one national winner, but identifying pockets of promise kind of regionally as a way to identify uh, what approaches that could be very customized to the local environment, because especially with climate change, so many of the solutions are really locally uh, driven um, with climate. Um, such that then uh, we could study and understand and develop the evidence to know what kind of practices should be uh, scaled to other cities. And that goes beyond policy to kind of behavior and the way that they're incentivizing folks in the community to actually change perhaps their energy consumption behavior um, towards, a broader, uh, towards a broader objective. So prizes and competitions and challenges, kind of this way of thinking about the problem first and then the, the whom you need to incentivize in order to uh, potentially achieve that outcome, apply across not just science and technology uh, uh, challenge areas, but also um, uh, around areas of social impact. And we've seen um, some experimentation there with community community, uh, community college 
uh, performance challenges as well, trying to understand what makes a community college be high performing. The Aspen Institute did a community college excellence prize that was focused on that kind of evidence and understanding around what makes a, um, a community college a, a, a high um, performing one versus uh, not uh, a high performing one based on education metrics that can be kind of difficult sometimes uh, to navigate. So um, yeah, I, I'll just I'll just stop there. Thanks, Jen. I think we had just have one uh, kind of question uh, for the, the panel in our last few minutes and just trying to think um, prospectively a bit towards the future in, in this uh, in this field is where do you see cross border collaboration going? Uh, we talked a little bit about it with like mini laterals. And so I would just get maybe a one minute answer from each of the, the panelists. Uh, do you see this as a phenomenon, a phenomenon that's going to be increasing? Uh, do you have any specific things that you think uh, are going to be like the, the big button issues that we should all be working on together uh, in the next uh, five to 10 years? Or how about you first, Jeff? I will just say, and I echo some of the things that, they, that other panelists shared today, that many of our largest challenges today are inherently cross-border. And so there are going to need to be ways that even if from a process standpoint, it's difficult to figure out how to, from a process, from a culture, from an ecosystem health and building perspective, that it's difficult to kind of do it together. Uh, many of the challenges that, that we face as a globe today uh, cannot, be, uh, cannot be achieved based on the boundaries that we've set. So we're going to have to increasingly um, and work through some of those, uh, those issues that may be more procedural, but that will then require us to develop strong partnerships and trust and open collaborative relationships with our partners in order to be able to do that. Thank you, Jen. And how about you, Jen? Yeah, so I mean, I'm just building on what Jen was saying earlier, the European Commission for 10 years now has been running a social innovation challenge competition. This year, it's on skills for you know, green jobs. It's been on things like reducing food waste, plastics. And to my mind, the next step, stage is to really institutionalize those, make, make them much much bigger, much more linked into the policymakers and procurement priorities of people like, uh, uh, like Theo. I do think we need new ways of institutionalizing this as we have for science, so everything doesn't have to be reinvented from scratch each time. But at least for the foreseeable future, as several have said, this will be driven by enthusiasm. You have to have people who want to collaborate, and that in a way gets over some of the cultural problems. And that will mean different geog geographies and geometries of people really working with similar cities, similar nations, similar problems in probably very quite messy uh, uh, groupings, quite unlike the UN or the European Union or the more sort of standardized multilateral bodies. Thank you very much, Jeff. And how about you, Abdullah, your, your sense of where this, uh, where this field is moving? I definitely see it uh, strengthening with, within time. I mean, uh, we as a world, probably in the region here uh, specific, we're, we're facing a lot of regional challenges, let's see, you know, when it comes to uh, scarcity of resources, we've seen a lot of initiatives taking place lately. I mean, uh, the carbon neutrality have been uh, mentioned several times here, but uh, some other stuff, food security, water security. Uh, and I think we see it over here in this, specifically in the region, you know, the unemployment rates in some countries, definitely they are, these are all signs of uh, stronger need, let's say, at least for uh, cross-cultural cl collaborative in the future. Thank you, Abdullah. And last word to you, Theo. So I think um, I, I'd look at it from two perspectives. Um, one is um, the, the area in which there's around climate change. Um, and this is collaboration between the public and private sector because there is a sort of unity of leadership uh, on the corporate board level and public sector board level uh, on that. National companies that span uh, jurisdictions in helping to convene and partner and fund uh, 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 mechanisms to do that. But I think in, in practice, um, um, 
where we will see the broadest bit of is collaborate of collaboration is those discussions about the foundations that I was talking about before when people are determining what standards we should be using um, um, how we approach data and use data better and the shared methodologies about how we design and convene uh, and innovate together all of those things uh, just just riffing on what 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 Jeff was saying it you know that they, they take quite a lot of thought to spin up if you if you're starting from scratch and there's limited resource and limited capacity in in city government to do that so um that sharing of those foundations of growth supported by new institutions i think uh is is the the uh, the direction of travel um that will have uh, a, a significant impact. Very good. Thank you very much, Theo. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you all very much for joining us. Thanks from the OECD. Uh, thanks for, for Marco, who, who uh, unfortunately had some internet connections um, and is on the phone with the help desk. So uh, we, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Um, we didn't have a chance to get to all of the questions, um, but I think a lot of them are contained in the report. We have some questions on things like frameworks and types of stakeholders to be working with. We tried to document as much of that as possible in the report, so I'd encourage you to check that out. Um, thank you so much to Abir and, and Janos uh, for, for opening up the session. Um, and we, uh, we really appreciate it. And we have our third report in the series that we'll be issuing uh, early next year. Um, with that, I'll, I'll uh, get you back to the rest of your day. So thank you all very much.